If you've been researching your family history, you're probably getting itching to tell their story and maybe even write a book. But those are kind of two different skill sets. Well, author Jill Phillips can really identify with your dilemma because she comes from an academic background and really wasn't a storyteller at all, per se. But she developed her skills and put them all together in a wonderful new book. It's called Lamb Lash Street, a portrait of 1960s post-war London through one family story. Jill is going to be here today to talk about the benefits of telling your family's story, why it's worth the time and the effort. She's also going to share with you some really tangible ways that she developed her storytelling skills. There's a lot to learn about telling your family's story, and we're going to do that right now. Well, hi, Jill. Welcome to the show. So glad to have you here. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled to be here. Well, I'm excited to talk to you. We've got lots of things to cover. We want to talk about uh, being a great storyteller for the family historian. We want to talk about getting a book published, which is something that you've done, and talk about your new book, which of course is Lamb Lash Street. And in the book, you talked about how your uncle in specifically shared a lot of stories with you from his uh, fighting days in World War II. And uh, I'm interested to know kind of what impact that had on you and and maybe go from there to why is it important for our viewers to be thinking about collecting these stories and sharing them? My uncle was uh, one of my favorite uncles and uh, growing up we had a multi-family house. So my family was on the top floor and one floor down, there were no doors or anything in between, just a staircase and they had their suite. Um, That's my auntie and uncle were living. And uh, just before my uncle died, my uncle died in 2011. Um, it was about two or three months before I'd come over from Canada to visit him. And he said, I've written down some of my war stories and I would l- love to turn it into a book. And I thought, well, that's nice. You know, it's very nice. And then uh, poor uncle passed on and we had a small inheritance from that. And so I thought, you know what, I'm going to write those stories for him. And that's how the stories are in the book, because I wanted his stories to be in there as well as my mum's. And what I I learned from uncle is that he was, um, he was 18, 17, 18 years old when he was signed up in World War II. And despite seeing horrendous things, I mean, he was um, on the convoys going across the Atlantic and he's, and in between, so he was in the merchant Navy and the Royal Navy had the boats in between. So there was the boats alternated so they could give good coverage to the, um, the cargo. And he said one of the saddest things he ever saw was when he saw his friends from the other boats, fellow mariners. Uh, the boats had been hit by the torpedoes. They were in the darky, dark, murky water of the Atlantic and they weren't able to stop to pick them up. They were told not to stop because it would put the whole ship at risk. But despite these horrendous things that happened to him, he was the nicest man I've ever met, very happy-go-lucky, took, he loved people. He would go out and just walk to say hello to people. He absolutely adored people. I never, ever saw him lose his temper or get angry. Somehow his philosophy on life was, well, you know, that's just be nice to people. Um, he wasn't um, angry at what happened to him. He, uh, I, I didn't, I saw him sad a little bit, but not very much. So I think what I learned from uncle is that you could be a very positive people. And maybe because so many people he knew had lost their lives so early in his life, he really appreciated and valued life itself. And so he really felt that people were an important part of his life. And I think that shaped his personality. And I benefited from that because uh, he was a great person to listen to and to be with. So, um, so I, I'm thrilled to death that and honoured that I've actually been part of his life. And that's why I really wanted to pay tribute to that in the book. Well, you really kind of illustrated why um, sharing the stories is so important because we get that advantage of benefiting from the experiences of others without having to necessarily go through them ourselves. And um, to also, from what you're describing, wow, to see his reaction, uh, you know, I think a lot of people today are hollering about this and that, and, and they don't really know that kind of hardship, do they? 
No, they don't. Um, and, I, and I've thought about that. Um, I think every generation has its challenges. Um, I think it's very difficult to, although uncle had to face death and dying very early in his life, um, the, the challenges we've been facing the past 12 months have been difficult as well. And if I had to think of the one thing that really pulled them through, my family through with their um, challenges, and even from my experience, I think other people with this last year, is people are so important. These supportive people are what gets you through. In a sense, it, it's not relevant whether you're on video or you're talking to somebody on the phone because they didn't have that back in World War II. But what they did have, they had the community around them and their, a lot of it was family as well. And it was the people in the family who were saying, no, we can do this, we're, we're gonna keep going. Uh, and those are the people that really helped him deal with his challenges. And I think it's the same today. So the circumstances are very, very different. But I think when we're all challenged, one of the things we value more than anything is those people that come up to us and say, how are you doing? Are you okay? Anything I can do to help you? It must have been tough for you and all those types of things. So, um, so that's what I, I think every, you know, I think this generation has its challenges in a different way because the technology is different. But I think the, the basic challenges as individuals is, is the same, to be honest. Right. Well said. Well, I'm sure it must have meant an awful lot to him to have you interested in asking. You know, it's interesting. There's, as I look through my family tree, I notice that, you know, there's a storyteller here and there's a storyteller there, maybe somebody who's interested in family history, but there, they can be few and far between within a family. And yet it means so much when somebody asks you your story and acknowledges they may not know everything about you. And uh, I know that you talked with your mom a lot and she's a big part yeah. of this book. Did you discover a lot of new things about her? And is that something that, um, that people who are listening who are thinking about asking the other people in their family about their stories that they can really benefit from? Oh, yes. I mean, I, when I started this, as I said, it started from wanting uncle's stories to be shared. And then when I started talking to mum about, oh, so mum, how did you meet dad? And um, what happened during the war? And what happened to uncle so-and-so? So all those questions, just general chit-chat questions. I learned an awful lot about my parents. I learned, and, and as a child, you know, even an adult child, there are certain things about your family's decision-making over the years. You think, why did they do that sort of thing? And um, I think I understand better, not fully, but I understand better. And I, I got a sense of peace as well from that. Because um, when we left Lamla Street, I was fairly young and um, I was really angry in a sense. And I sort of not, I carried it with me really. I, it was at the back of my mind throughout the years. And I finally understood why mum decided that we should leave there. And which was because of the change in the economy and everyone was leaving anyway, but I, I didn't really understand that at the time. So I think for me, I have a sense of peace from better understanding mum and dad to a certain extent, because dad had a, a troubled background as well. And actually when I was writing the book, there were some things in there about my nan who, were, who was a very um, colorful lady, shall we say. Um, she enjoyed, um, when she was, she worked on a, a pushing railway carriages um, up and down the line, physically pushing them at Waterloo Station in London. And she had um, a, a, a curved back because one of the railway carriages hit her. She was a single parent. My dad's um, father um, was a, a violent drunk, basically. Um, but I learned more about these things and they became more real people. They weren't just my mum and dad and my nan. They became real people who had difficult decisions to make and they made a decision. Uh, and because of that, my life is slightly different. So I really, when I finished writing the book, I really valued that. I really feel that I understand why my parents did some of the things they did and the decisions they made. Um, and also understand more about my nan. So everybody whose name is in the book, I understand more about who they really were as people, not just as my aunts and uncles and mum and dad. So. I really find also just by doing the family history research, let alone all the conversations, 
you do, you gain empathy. You start to uh, have such an understanding. We don't necessarily agree with everything all of our ancestors did, but we certainly know that in that time and in that place, you know, it was their call. And um, we can also make choices about what we do and what we don't do once we hear about it. And hearing stories, I'm, I'm interested, was your uncle a really good storyteller? And did you feel like you were a really good storyteller before you started writing the book? Uh, my uncle was a great storyteller. Um, my, my lasting picture of my uncle is a, a pint of beer in his hand, never more than a pint, you know, just sipping. And he loved to talk. If he could have you there for five hours a day, he would sit and talk to you about everything from the war to he loved horse racing to everything. In fact, it's to the point where my aunt was saying, oh, George, will you please be quiet for a few minutes? And one of those people. And um, as for me being a storyteller, no, furthest thing from my mind. Uh, no, I was an academic, a professional. No, no, it's all evidence-based. You don't have any of this soft sort of storytelling thing. Um, but no, it was, um, it's one of the most rewarding things I've done. And um, when mum passed on, um, to have the book with her details in there meant so much to me. I can take comfort from that. I didn't see any of this coming when I started writing. I really just wanted to get Uncle's stories down. Uh, but it's so rewarding. It um, connects you more with your family. Um, and I've learned so much more because everybody who reads the book now um, within the family comes back to me and says, oh, I didn't know about this. And I didn't know about that. And is it true what Sanso said? And so we're all connecting more because of this book. Um, but I would also add that when I said I was writing it, they really thought I was just losing it, really. <laughs> it wasn't, it, there isn't a family tradition, really, within our family of, of writing anything. I was pretty much the first one to do that. And um, so when you, you come along, say, yes, well, I'm going to write a book, you know. Um, and um, they say, oh, yeah, fine, fine. And then they talk about something else, the weather or something. But the reality is now it's out there. It has connected the family in so many more ways because we can all talk about them. Although um, that whole generation has gone. My mum was the youngest of um, 10 children. All my aunts and uncles have gone. She was the very last. But at least us, the cousins now, can we can sit and talk about what was in the book and do you know more about this? So I'm learning, even now, learning more and more. I could sort of write another couple of chapters in this book because people are talking about it now and I did not anticipate any of this and if you had told me that before I started I would have said no you have no idea what you're talking about <laughs> to be honest that's fantastic you get the stories out there it's, it's like when you just start sharing then it starts to come out of the woodwork doesn't it and you get a chance to um, kind of facilitate those stories out of other people. It's interesting that you said that you're, you know, you were an academic, you're uh, evidence-based kind of person. Of course, doing genealogy research, we're definitely very focused on the data and the evidence and that kind of thing. But many, many people are yearning to really tell the story and tell it in a way that people would actually want to hear it. Were there any tangible things that you did to try to hone your storytelling skills or learn more about how to do that? Okay, um, I was sort of, the only experience I had of writing was I wrote a thesis, my thesis, my master's degree. That was it, um, which is a very different experience, but it's still a lot of information. So um, I told myself, yes, you can do this um, because you've done this. So that, that kept me going. I think that was one of the things I found the most difficult really was just keeping going through the process. The, 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 the key thing you have to do um, is to just do it, basically. I know it sounds very straightforward, but the more you write, the better you get at it. The more you tell the stories, the better you get at the storytelling. Um, don't on day one think that you should be able to write some massive, great, um, you know, Lord of the Rings type book. Just take it a piece at a time. Um, the other thing that I did, um, I just literally wrote down the stories I could remember. Um, you know, you, you have these stories in your head. Oh, yes, when the aunties were sitting around talking at the wedding, they, they wrote about this episode and that episode. And so I literally took um, one new page, one fresh sheet of paper for every idea. And even if I had like only two or three lines at the top, then that was fine because later on I would add to that story. 
Because what I would do, I would then say to mum, oh, mum, do you remember when um, you went, you were evacuated during the war and you went to Wales, you and auntie, can you tell me more about it? And she would talk about, love to talk about it. And so that way I focused on just getting the stories down and then to turn it into a, to a, a page turner, hopefully, in terms of an interesting book, um, the way I think of it is, it is uh, I call it a washing line analogy, and that's the only way I can think of it. So the individual stories are the articles of clothing that you pin on the washing line. The storyline is the washing line itself. It pins it, it holds it all together. So there's almost two layers in a book. There are the individual stories, and it's how you string them together. And so um, what I did, I took all of my individual stories on separate paper, I printed them all off, had them all over the floor, the dining room table, everywhere. And I thought, now, how can I, I looked for common themes so I could make the storyline link together. The other thing I looked for, some things are, um, it was a year, 1963, a whole year. So Valentine's Day is obviously on February, Easter is March, April, the summer holidays were July. So I could string the stories together based on the the time of the year so that was a start and then I'd look at the stories I still had left and how could I combine those stories in with the stories I already had and the other thing that one of the best pieces of information I got was you should always have some romance in your stories (laughs) and so I thought no I I can't write romance never do that Um, anyway it so happened that I had a little romantic episode when I was about 10 years old with Anthony, his name was. And so Anthony became the part of the washing line that held the story together. And all these other stories linked in with it. Uh, And that's how I did it. And the other thing I did, which I was really happy with, was I bookended the story. So that's, it starts with Christmas and ends with Christmas. So it starts in Christmas 1962, ends in Christmas 1963. But the circumstances within the family have changed tremendously just in that 12 month period. So there are similarities at the end of the book as there were in the beginning of the book as to what Christmas, the events that happened at Christmas. But the family was very different because of the difficulties they'd faced during that, that year. Uh, and it seems to work. People seem to enjoy it. So um, I was happy with that. Yeah. I love it. And I love your washing line idea. That's wonderful. And I know, you know, you were talking about just the separate pieces of paper. I know some people use like uh, software like Scrivener where they can have uh, sometimes I, I've done things in storyboarding with PowerPoint. Just each slide is just to help me kind of organize, even though that's not the final place. So whatever I guess works for the person who's trying to do the storytelling, but I like those pieces and then weaving them together, kind of stringing them together. Um, And it sounded like, did you, well, I I should ask, did you know early on what the beginning and the end would be? That's probably the biggest problem because many people are looking, they've been looking at the whole family tree and they'd love to start writing some of this and starting telling some of these stories. But I always advise people, oh gosh, think in terms of like chapters, <laughs> like chapter books, you know, don't think about the whole thing. It's too much and we'll never get it done. How did you decide where I'm going to start, where I'm going to end and how much was too much and how much is too little? It, it's a challenge. It is. It's a yeah. real challenge. Um, I decided I wanted the year to be 1963, which was the year when um, we had massive changes within our family. We relocated as well at the end of 1963. Um, so I, I knew I wanted that. Then I literally wrote down everything I could remember from those times, those days, including the Christmas and the daffodil competition at school and the swimming lessons I had at school. So there was a section about school, 10 year old, you know, that's a lot of mm-hmm. your life at school. And then I said it had the romance as well. It can be very overwhelming. Um, I did try some of those other techniques that you mentioned. Um, I tried the PowerPoint one. Uh, I went online, I looked to see what software, what software there was. I looked at storyboarding, like buy the cards and put mm-hmm. the story line there, sticky notes, everything. But I found this worked for me the best. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that the, the best advice I can give to would-be authors is don't be overwhelmed by it. Um, it's, it can be overwhelming, but just stick with your family stories 
Um, like I said, don't worry about the, the stringing together until you have the family stories there. And then you can piece it all together like a jigsaw. So try not to get too overwhelmed by it. And if you just take it a piece at a time, that is the best advice I, I can offer. Um, I try to do all sorts of things. I try to make it much, I try, as I said, I had sticky notes on the wall and everything. It really didn't work for me, but you have to find what works for you. And that's the other thing. It doesn't matter what works for you as long as it's working for you. I agree. And it, it doesn't matter what really what anybody else did, even the experts, you know, if, if, something kind of works with your brain and that this is the yeah. direction to go. I liked yeah. that you took the one year time frame, which kind of gave you something concrete to work with, but you had the reflections of the stories. So you could go back in time. You could bring in other eras, things from your uncle's stories while still having that continuity of the one year time frame. I'm wondering, cause has, did anybody resist uh, I've had lots of uh, emails from my listeners and my viewers who say, oh, I've got somebody I'd really love to interview in my family and include their stories, but they just are so tight lipped. Did you have anybody who resisted and did you have any special techniques or approaches to kind of help warm things up? Um, I think you have to be sensitive to the fact that um, there are some family stories that families really don't want people to know about. So I try to keep it on the light side. Um, the, and, and if I came across a part where I thought it was a little bit upsetting for some people, I either did not include it or I, um, I sort of tamed it down a little bit. Um, but yeah, you, you can't, for, family is made of allegiances, of very strong allegiances over the years. Um, if people didn't want to talk about it, um, I would go and ask somebody else in case they knew why they, you know, what was it was all about. Um, but basically, if they, if they didn't want it in the book, which is really what you're saying, um, then I, I didn't push it because well, we don't know the details. We don't know what happened at that time, why it's such a sensitive area. Um, and I really wanted something that the family would be warm and positive towards. I really did not want it to get... Um, stuck in a sense of, oh, well, you know, she spoke about this and that's not the way it was, you know. I didn't want that sort of feeling. Um, and I hoped that by keeping it, the story being about a 10-year-old, that that would be less controversial because a 10-year-old has a very black and white view of the world. It's either that's the way it is or that's the way it isn't sort of thing. You don't get into the, the, the nuances of adult life and behaviours and so on. So... Um, I, that for me was an easy way out because I kept it with a young child. But I, I, I'm not somebody that, I mean, the whole point of this was to celebrate the family, not to cause division. So, and I know, but I have spoke to other authors who feel that it's a time to state these issues. Um, that wasn't what I was looking for with this. Yeah, I can appreciate that. And for a genealogist, you know, they can collect all the stories, but then when it comes to the writing you can make some choices about that as well. Not everything we find necessarily has to be included in a narrative or in a, in a storytelling um, vehicle. And that brings me to a final question is I, I kind of hear you talking about the audience. You knew who your audience was. And I think that's probably an important thing right up front, is it, isn't it? Because that will provide you with some parameters about what to cover, what not to, and the approach. Um, it did. Um, I assumed that it would be the 60 plus group because of, though they could reminisce about the old days. And, and, and so I, I expected that. And it is. But interestingly enough, there are also some younger people in the late teens, early 20s who are relating to the 10 year old and her challenges in life. Mm -hmm. And I did not foresee that. That was a surprise for me. Um, so just going through romance and, and breakup and uh, trying to understand what's happening in your parents' world and how it's impacting on you and how your parents don't really understand you and all these sorts of things. I had quite a few people come back to me to say that they could relate to that. Um, and the other thing is that they, um, they, they were saying, these, this, the younger people were saying that as tough as this year has been in terms of COVID and so on, they did, never really thought of the other generations, the earlier generations who, for example, during World War II, you don't know if your neighbor's house is still going to be there the next day. It could have been bombed overnight when you, they had the blitz going. 
um, whole generations were of, of men uh, went off to fight and didn't come back again. So I had some comments about that as well, which surprised me that I really thought the relevance was going to be more of a reminiscence. But I find that just the struggles that we went through in that year, people, the younger people are relating to that and saying, well, you know, I thought we had it pretty tough, but maybe we don't have it that tough. So, um, so that was nice, actually. I, I, I really was, it was full of surprises. And I have to say this whole being an author for the first time um, has been full of surprises. And a lot of them have amazed me. And I would so recommend that, that other people go through this process because it's such a rewarding thing. And, and the book is nice to have. Um, and that's lovely. And, and book sales and that, they're in there. That's, that's okay. But that's not the, the real thing that I enjoy about the, uh, the book is the fact that it's been so meaningful to other people. And even my brother is reading it now, <laughs> so, which I didn't expect. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been good. It's, um, it's far bigger than you think it is. It really is. And very rewarding. Yeah, very rewarding. Well, let's talk for a minute about um, how you went about publishing the book. Did you self-publish? Did you find a publisher? What was that process like? Um, I self-published, but I did ask for help. Um, I really, I mean, as I said, my, my life has been in another area completely. So what I did, um, and, I, and I know you, you know these people, um, book launches were the people I went with. Um, partly because the CEO is Canadian and uh, she'd been in another business prior to that and I'd been following her and then she created this this new business called Book Launchers. But they've been brilliant, I have to say. They have handheld me through the process and I'm so pleased I I am part of that process. If you go with a, a publisher, they basically, they take your product, your book, and they decide what the front cover is going to be, um, what the uh, marketing is going to be like. They, they basically take over. They're, they're, they're a marketing machine. Um, but because I did it, I got to choose what was on the front cover. And actually what is on the front cover, let me just show you quickly, is so that, that's actually me at age 10. So that's a school picture. And down here, this is actually Lamlash Street itself with my auntie standing on the steps. So it, it means a lot to me that I could... You know, I worked with a designer. I, I, I worked with the professionals all through this, but I have a book I'm very proud of, and it has a lot of meaning for me because these are personal photographs on the front. And so, um, and now we're in some more, I say, marketing piece of it. And they have handheld me through the whole thing. I have learned so much. Um, so I'm, I, I'm pleased with my choice and um, the where I got some, the little bit of money I had from uncle, that actually helps with the, the help I was to pay for the help that I'm getting with the book. So I thought that was a nice way of tying it all together. So it's basically uncle's money is helping me with this book. Right, um, he's helping so, make it happen. Well, that's right. So yeah, I'm, I'm so pleased, so pleased actually, I can't say. So if anyone is, and I, I'm sure there are pros and cons to both, but for me, I wanted to learn about the industry and the business, and I wanted control over what I had. I didn't want to hand it over to somebody and just receive the book two weeks later. Say, okay, here it is. This is what we've decided. That, that's not sort of the person I am really either. <laughs> so uh, I'm, I'm a bit more hands-on. Well, the beauty of self-publishing is you also can decide how big you want to go or how small you want to go. You can just print it for your family, make it available through the website that you used, and leave it at that. You can hire a press agent, somebody to help you get it out there in the mainstream and, and do interviews like this. And so there's so many options today and it's so much more yeah. affordable. Although it sounds like you did make an investment in um, some of the pieces. I, I know uh, my first couple of books, I did the covers myself completely. And a lot of these websites had the tools right there on the website that you could create them and make them any way you wanted. So it's amazing the kind of flexibility that we have um, today, what's what's something that um, you didn't expect going into printing and on-demand type printing yourself, publishing your, for yourself, um, that you could help maybe uh, forewarn folks who are thinking about that option or just something to keep in mind up front so they kind of don't end up painting themselves into a corner somewhere? Um, I think for me, 
the amount of detail questions that you are asked. So, for example, with the book, um, what colour pages would you, would you like cream? Would you like white? Um, how much spacing would you like on the page? Um, what font size would you like? Would you like um, a blank a chapter page in between each chapter or do you not want that? And there, so the detail was overwhelming at times. That's why I was happy that I had some handholding going on because that helped me tremendously. Uh, otherwise, I think I would have spent hours reading about it, not doing you know, carrying out and actually getting it published. Um, I think from my perspective, I have to say, if I would suggest that you, you speak to somebody at least that has been through this process before, because it's, it's not difficult, but it's far more complex than you might imagine. Um, and I think that's the best advice I can give. Like if you have an author who's been through it and they, they, they have published a book, then speak to them, link in with groups that have done this type of thing before, because they will be very helpful to you. Um, I was, as I said, I was helped all way through. So for me, it was, it went relatively smoothly, but it did take, a, oh, the other thing is it takes a lot longer than you think it will. Um, just to finish writing the book takes a lot longer than you want it to. <laughs> um, and then you have the editing process. So the editing process, I had five different editors because one's for content, one is for facts and, you know, there, there are different aspects of it. So, and then, so there's two, two weeks in between, um, at least, while they, it goes off and it comes back and then you either approve or don't approve of the changes and it goes to somebody else and comes back. So the process is very long. So um, if you want a book that you're going to be very proud of, allow about twice the time you think you're going to need. It's not a quick process. And really even designing the cover, um, I thought, oh, two weeks I have that cover done. Well, you would not believe how long it took me to think about this cover and that cover. And then I asked this person and that person. I think the cover took me about six weeks. Uh, I'm very happy with it, but I was thinking it was two weeks and done. So it will take a lot longer than you, you assume it would. That is great advice. And I can attest to it. It's very, very true. But it's worth it because, you know, obviously you're happy oh, with what you yes. ended up with. And, and that's the goal. In publishing a book, writing a book like this, you want it to be compelling. What advice could you give the uh, hopefully soon to be author how to make their book more compelling for the reader to keep the re get the reader engaged and keep them engaged? Right. So I think the, the thing I learned was foreshadowing. So drop little breadcrumbs throughout the storyline as to what's coming. So you, you say, oh, yes, and this happened but I'll tell you about that later on. And so I think the foreshadowing piece was something I had, that was, I knew what foreshadowing was obviously, but to actually write in that, that way was, was, um, was an, an eye opener for me. I think the other thing that I did in the book is I had short stories, which hopefully did not make it too long and boring. So I was trying to, so the, the stories were, um, the sections within the stories were um, about five or six different locations and you know, at school, home, um, um, those, those types of things. So I, and at the church, those sorts of things. So I tried to put a lot of variety into it. I wanted it to be something where people really got a, a really good idea of the whole environment that, that was there at the time and um, playing on the bomb sites from the demolished houses from the war. I want, and then uncle's story. So I wanted there to be lots of variety. So I would suggest that as well. Um, personally, I, I, I'm a, a, somebody who visualizes things that I, I see things in picture form. Um, and if I see a, a page of writing and there's no picture being drawn, then it's not what I'm looking for. And I know some readers are, but that's not what I was, uh, I enjoy. I like to be able to visualize, to see the scene, if you like, that I'm describing. So I would say that as well. Um, but yes, try and keep, don't, don't get too involved and have too many long, 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 long scenes where you're um, talking about something over and over again about five different ways. That's, that's not a good way to start, I wouldn't think. <laughs> I think that's great advice. And you gave the reader a lot of satisfaction that um, you can tell kind of many stories within the story and you get some conclusion there and you start to see how it fits together. So you've got things to look forward to. I like that and the foreshadowing. Well, let's talk a bit about 
Lamb Lash Street. Um, tell us about the backdrop of the story. So where had London been at the beginning, what, 1962? And where did things, how did things change just dramatically in that year? Maybe both for the, the area and for your family. Yeah. So basically, um, Lamlash Street is a, a very small street in London. Um, it's the house that we lived in, sadly, has gone now, but it was an old Victorian house. It was 100 years old and condemned when we moved into it. Um, but there was a housing shortage after World War II. Uh, the Marshall Plan from the US had loaned so much money uh, to, to restart the economy in the UK. But the reality was it wasn't enough. So we were living in condemned houses. Now, as kids, we were fairly happy that we weren't thinking we were, you know, in a condemned house. So it's just that, oh, it's just normal. Okay, that house is condemned. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the roof used to leak. There was always a bucket in the middle of the room <laughs> to catch the water when it rained. And it was only 18 years after World War II. So although I was born in the mid-50s, um, it was... My parents and my, my aunts and uncles, all my, the, the adults in my life, had lived through World War II. Uh, Mum was 10 when the war broke out. And the, she was the youngest, so the others were slightly older. So they had been through food rationing, bombing, um, family members dying from the war. Uh, and so it shaped who they were. And yet, 1963 was the time of the Beatles and the time of Carnaby Street and Mary Quant clothing. So we were in a, oh, isn't life great? You know, we were at the beginning of everything. A Telstar was a satellite, communication satellite that had been launched. It was so popular um, that there was a song by the Tornadoes at the time called Telstar. So everything was very spacey and exciting. And for the very first time, there was a transatlantic call between the US and the UK. So for us kids, it was very exciting, but our parents had come from a very, very sad time with a lot of deprivation. And um, mum said food rationing was awful in its days. You barely had enough. Everyone was really thin during World War II because of the food rationing. And, and I think that's why mum overfed us most of our lives, <laughs> to be honest. So, uh, yeah, it was a um, time of much contrast. That's the best way I can say it. So you're being raised by people who have been at war and we were thinking life was great. So it's, uh, it was quite different. Yeah. You said your, your uh, family left Lamb Lash. Why did they leave and did they change and kind of scatter after that or what happened? They did, not from choice. Um, because there was... Um, they were building new towns. They called them new towns outside London, at the London area. And these were new developments um, with houses where the roofs didn't leak. Um, they were building new schools. They were building new factories. And so the, the factory that my most of my aunts, or well, most of my uncles, really, a few aunts, um, worked for, the factory decided to relocate. There were tax advantages, nicer buildings. So it was better for the business. And it was a card factory uh, business. And so the, the difficult decision had to be made whether to leave the family, because once they moved down there, um, I, I think about half the family moved down there. The rest of us were still in at Lamlash Street and, and the areas. So what it really did, it really, it broke up the family. The relocation broke up the family. One, I, I spoke to my cousin about this. Yeah, he said, oh, I can remember, he said, is one year, like Christmas of 1962, I had tons of presents under the trees from all the aunties and uncles. And then he said the following year, he said, I had three. And that, that's because everyone had moved away and there was no internet. Telephone calls are very expensive. The only means of communication was just paper and pencil, the mail. That was it. Uh, people didn't travel that much. It was expensive. Cars weren't as comfortable. Um, so it was... It really did destroy the family and, and, and the supports within the family. That was the other thing. Uh, when you have a large family, there's always a group of people that you can go to and there's some family crises. Uh, then they would say, oh, never mind, we'll sit down, we'll talk, talk this through. Um, they were all gone. So not only did us as children lose our aunts and uncles and cousins, but my mum and dad lost their supports as well. My auntie and uncle moved away. They lived with us from the first 10 years of my life. 
they moved to the other side of, of London. And I think it was, oh, it must have been like 15, 20 years before we saw them again. Mm, my gosh. And that's a very significant. I mean, they're really part of your core family. If, they're, if you're living together like that for a child to have kind of part of that family that you live with every single day, just gone, that must have really been something. It was, and it was, and I've been talking to a few people since who have read the book, and they said it was they had the same experience. That one minute their family, it seems as if one minute the family was there, and the next minute they had to move to to get employment. They had to go where the uh, the business went, and that was happening all over London um, and the other larger centres, the ones that were bombed heavily, not so much ones out in the suburbs because they didn't get the bombing. So their their infrastructure was there, the businesses were there, the buildings were in pretty good shape. Whereas half the buildings in London, you could have just pushed them in, you know, with a finger and they would fall down. They were that bad. They were condemned buildings, every one of them. So, um, so yeah, it was tough. And it, what was tough as well is that as children, we had to move from a Cockney London environment where we knew everybody and we had our own way of speaking to a very refined Kent, which is um, middle, more middle class area. Mm-hmm. So you're there, this poor child who's, you know, 11, um, you're going through the beginning of puberty, your life is uncertain, you've just moved, and everybody there speaks differently from the way you speak. Um, and the other thing was, I, I, I think I just had, um, I had a different colour school uniform from them, and that was a horrible thing to happen when you're that age. God. So I had a, a dark green uniform, and theirs was light grey, and so I stuck out like a sore thumb. It's very, very difficult. Um, and actually, that's why I'm thinking of making that my second book, to talk about those aspects, because... It's not something that people have really, I haven't heard people talking about it a great deal, to be honest. Um, the loss that children and, and relatives suffered when they moved away from London and their support systems. And, and, and that I'm sure happened to so many people. You have readers in England, obviously, in Canada, in the United States. Um, what are you hoping that they're going to um, walk away from the book with? Oh, um, I think, well, one, one of the, some of the feedback I'm, I'm getting is um, that those difficult times stay with people. Um, I had somebody um, writing a comment and he was uh, writing from the US and he said, originally I'm from Manchester, he said, and I can identify in terms of losing family because I was of that generation. So I'm hoping that by them reading the book, that they're going to start talking about some of these losses, because we know that these sorts of losses are massive. And if you talk about them, it can help um, to heal. Um, It certainly helped me with the healing. So I'm hoping that they get that from it as well. Um, The other thing is I'm hoping they also, as I said earlier, will understand that if you have the right people in your life, you can overcome anything. And I'm hoping they get that from it as well. Um, And also there's, it's, it's not, you know yes there's a serious side to the book but there's a lot of um reminiscence in there as well I mean when I talk about um I don't know if this translates well to the US but Nitty Nora I don't know if that means anything it does in Canada and it does here well this is lady who used to comb your hair for head lice <laughs> oh my okay that makes sense Nitty Nora you, that's right so it was Nitty Nora that and was her was, job oh yeah she used to come once a week she used to go around all the stores once wow. a week, but it would line up and um, she'd have this comb, she'd dip, dip it in, uh, disinfect in between and sort of part your hair. Oh, no, you're good. On to the next one. <laughs> and, and, and so it's in there. I had this episode about Nitty Nora and somebody stopped me and said, I can remember that, you know, Nitty Nora used to come to our school as well. And they're in Canada. It's like, <laughs> oh, really? So I think that's, a, a, you know, these little stories that, you can laugh at now, you know, there's a serious side, but there's also a fun side to it as well. Um, and um, oh, the other thing is um, the, um, when I learned to swim, so we had school swimming lessons, which was fairly advanced for those years, um, to actually have that type of thing. So we used to go there. The lady who got us to swim never, ever got in the water. The oh. uh, only thing she ever did was she, she would go to swim around the edge of the pool and she'd have a, a broomstick about three inches in front of our nose 
So if you were, you, you were trying to swim, no, no technique, nothing, but if you were trying to swim, your best, and she saw you start to sink, she'd bring the broom handle closer so you could hold on to it, you wouldn't drown. <laughs> and that was our swimming techniques. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> there, was, there was no um, support, nothing. You know, there was, there was nothing. There was, it was literally just a broom handle and, and your will to live, and that was it. So I hope people get some fun out of it as well, because those, those looking back on now, they're, they're they're quite funny when you think about it. I love it. Well, and <clears throat> I guess if they want to learn how to, to speak Cockney too, I got a little <laughs> lesson on Cockney. And it was so interesting because as a, as a genealogist and a podcaster, I had interviewed a gentleman several years ago. He was a forensic linguist oh, and nice. he consulted on criminal cases, but I got talking to him about families. And I said, you know, we use little phrases, um, expressions, the way we say it, our accent, everything. And he said, I said, don't you think that we could actually trace some of the family history just by following some of that? He says, oh my gosh, you're absolutely right. And he, he was giving me examples of both in criminal and in his own family um, of those kinds of things. And I thought that's interesting that as you talked about the, the Cockney accent and the rhyming, tell people if they don't know just a little bit about what this whole rhyming thing was. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, company rhyming slang um, was the way we spoke. It's it, the theory was, and I don't it's just a myth that um, back in the Victorian age, they wanted to have a language whereby uh, they could carry on with their illegal activities where the police understand what was happening. And so they invented this sort of almost like a pidgin English type thing. So it's, it's company rhyming slang. Everything has to rhyme. So, for example, apples and pears rhyme with stairs. So if you say to somebody, can you go up the apples? They mean, can you go up the stairs? Uh, Barnet fair rhymes with hair. So mum would say to me, Jill, can you go up the apples and comb your barnet? So I knew <laughs> that meant go upstairs and comb my hair. And everything was rhyming slang, like trouble and strife is wife, which is a fairly well-known one. Plates of meat uh, is feet. And if your dogs are barking, it means your feet are aching. So <laughs> so it, it's like you're, you're bilingual in a sense, because you have regular English and then you have Cockney rhyming slang. But what it also did, I mean, it was a lot of fun, the language, uh, and there are whole books written on it now. Um, but in addition to that, it gave us a very strong identity. Mm -hmm. So we would talk to one another in Cockney rhyming slang. Um, and, and, and even now, there's a fair bit of it out there, actually. It's surprising how many, much of that London accent still around and the, and the Cockney rhyming slang. It, it's still around. People don't use it, but people know it. That must have been one of those things, too, as you moved away to Kent that uh, you had to give up. That was one more kind of loss in a way, just that whole community and the language. You know, it's funny, uh, Jill, my, I, people who've watched uh, Elevens is with Lisa, my YouTube show, I told them in the very first episode, my very all-time favorite television show, it, it's, it was called Good Neighbors here, but it was The Good Life in England. Right. And the ones who were self-sufficient, uh, Tom and Barbara. Oh, right. I remember those, yes. And there's a whole episode about when they get their hands on this old, old iron stove that they're going to use as self-sufficient in their kitchen. And there was a guy and he came in and he's doing this whole rhyming thing. And he's going to, she's, they're going back with, I'm like, what are they talking about? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. No yeah. And um, they were having a whole debate about the, the myth behind all of that. So it was awfully fun to read it in your book. And I'm sure that people who have any connection, particularly to England will have fun reading about your reminiscence. And if they don't, uh, but they also have English ancestor. They, they are going to be really enjoying um, just kind of the, the backstory here and what happened to people who stayed in England as well. Because I know from my husband, his grandfather immigrated in, from England uh, in Kent in 1912. Oh, right. okay. So it's really, it's really interesting to me to read yeah. more about those who did stay behind as well, because everybody's got a story to tell. And yours is in Lamlash Street, a portrait of 1960s post-war London through one family's story. And I highly recommend it. Jill thank Phillips, you. thank you so much for being on the show and sharing your stories. Appreciate it. It's been fun. Thank you.
Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation with author Jill Phillips. I think Lamb Lash Street is a book you're really going to enjoy. I'll have a link down in the video description here on my YouTube channel where you can get the book and also a link over to my website, genealogygems.com, where we'll have a show notes page for this video and a link there as well. If you haven't already done so, be sure and click that subscribe button here because that puts us in your favorites list here at YouTube. And we hope that we are your favorite place to come and learn about your family history. Thank you so much for watching, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.